All right. So to get the the cogs is the first step of this one, the cost of goods sold, because that's going to show you the the general trend. Is it going up? Is it going down? How how quickly is it going up? If it's going up, usually it's going up because most of our companies are growing, and as you grow, your revenue increases, but but so do your costs. Um, but again, that you really have to look at your own specific company. So that's your first step, and then you're going to look at the trend over time. So if it's increasing. How much is it increasing? What's driving that increase? Is it because the price of sugar has gone up a lot? Or is it just increasing because you're selling a lot more chocolate bars? And so of course you need to buy more sugar and more cocoa. So those are the ways that you can sort of parse that and really drill down after you get that sort of top line cogs um, shown in your paper. And then another thing that is recommended here is to show um, the operating expenses which speaks more to the, the overhead type of costs, which you're gonna wanna address um, these differences later on the next element where we looked at fixed versus variable costs. So this way you kind of have a sense of each of those separately and can sort of analyze the trends in each of them um, because maybe the trends in one are a little bit different than the trends in the other. Again, this is all gonna sort of reveal itself once you dig into that part of your um, the income statement or the annual report, also called a 10K. Um, this link here, it does link us to uh, a YouTube video that shows you how to go through that part of the income statement. And I see Gilbert's hand is raised. Um, go ahead, Gilbert, if I missed your question in the chat, you can go ahead and put it there. Unfortunately, we don't have audio for participants on, um, on this webinar, but we will absolutely answer your questions that you type in the chat. Um, uh, DNA, help me out here. Um, depreciation, um, Ellen's typing, so I'm hoping you remember offhand, Ellen. Thank you. Those accounting terms, I never took any accounting classes, so amortization, I always forget. Those, um, so depreciation isn't something we really deal with a lot in this course, but that's, you know, as your, your equipment sort of gets wear and tear over time, you want to depreciate that value and you put it in your income statement as a cost. Um, that all, that stuff is more something you'll, if you, if you haven't yet taken an accounting class that you would learn more about there. Um, so you don't have to worry about that too much. You want to mostly focus when it comes to COGS, focus on the, um, the input prices. Yeah, I mean, if you if you have a choice of not including it, if you're showing a graph, um, you don't have to include it because you're not really going to be talking about it. So if you if you have the option to to take it out and not include it, um, the depreciation part when you show the graph of the five years over time or a table, then then it's fine to keep it out since you're not going to speak to it. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's definitely, I mean, Ellen and, and Steve, both both of those things, and, and definitely more more complicated than, than we want to get into for, um, especially in terms of the accounting and an income statement for our entry-level students in um, an ECO 201. But, so yeah, if if the, again, if the data that you're presented with in your, in your income statement from your company gives you the option to separate COGS from depreciation and amortization, feel free to just focus on the COGS. Right. And operating expenses too. I mean, when we talk about um, operating expenses that, that we really are going to expect you to give some sort of analysis on, it's more things like salaried employees, um, rental space or or building a new factory, um, if, if that's applicable to your company, um, and things like advertising would fall under operating expenses. Um, yes, Trisha, that's accurate. So that's why um, you are required to do a publicly traded company 
because um, according to SEC rules, they have to submit this information to the public uh, on a regular basis. They do um, usually quarterly, but then they do a big annual statement, which is what we direct you to towards is the annual statement. Right, so, okay, so once you've gotten your, your data set up and you can dig a little bit into those trends, was it, like I mentioned, was it sugar or the price of sugar increasing or, um, or decreasing that, that was affecting the trends that you saw? Um, then you wanna, the last thing you wanna do here is see how it affects profitability. Now costs might be going up all the time, but that doesn't really tell us anything about profitability. You really do have to compare it to revenue. So if costs are not going up as fast as revenue, revenue is going up faster than costs, then your profit margin is increasing. So for every dollar of revenue that you're earning, you're keeping more of it as profit. Um, if the opposite is true, if your costs go up faster than your revenue, then your profit margin is decreasing. So for every dollar of revenue, you're not getting quite as much profit. So you really wanna look at those comparisons, those ratios to tell the full story here, because because of just overall growth in the company, profit might be getting bigger, but the profit margin might be getting smaller. So if you can really parse that out, you're really gonna show your instructor that you know what you're talking about and that you've been able to really dig deep in and understand what all this stuff is, that relationship between revenue, cost, profit, and profit margin, which is again, that, that ratio that you wanna look at. Um, Melora, I would, I would suggest um, you could refer back to it or you might want, you could repeat, I mean, technically in a paper, I would want to, I wouldn't want to repeat the same graph, but because your instructor won't have the milestone two when they're grading milestone three, um, they might want to see it again. So that might be something that when you put the paper together, you work out, but for now you should bring the, um, the graph back, at least, at least for the milestone bit. And then when you put everything together, um, make those connections with the, so you don't have to duplicate the graph. So Teresa asks, it has total operating expenses, which I thought was the second element. So the second element we're gonna get to, we can start now since I think we've covered this and I don't see any outstanding um, questions on this element itself. Um, Yes, Melora. So operating expenses um, comes into play a little bit more here when we look at the concepts of variable versus fixed cost to the company and how that informs their output decisions. So operating expenses is often the fixed cost of a company, like just running the company, all this, like I said, the salaried employees, um, advertising expenses for the year, um, running the factories, um, or is the variable cost of those inputs there, the hourly workers that work on the factory floor, um, there is the sugar and the cocoa that go into the candy bar. Um, so every company has sort of a different mix of variable costs and fixed costs. And that's that mix and how those costs work at the margin is going to affect their output decisions. Um, so that's something that you're gonna get a chance to, to look at here. You can discuss you know, which are their fixed costs and which are their variable costs and um, how, that's, how that's affecting their, the way that they, sub, that they create their products. So an example here, um, I'm not sure if it's actually in here. Let me see, it might've been above. Um, but if we use the, the Chipotle example, um, if there's been, I remember actually being at Chipotle a while ago and they weren't offering pork. They weren't offering the carnitas, I think it was, because um, the pork at the time, I, I don't know, I don't remember the exact reason, and I'm sure it's in their annual reports because it was quite a big deal. Um, it wasn't available, or it was terribly expensive for them to get, um, so they stopped offering it. Um, so if you look at it, that variable cost had gotten so high that at, at the margin, they really couldn't make money on it. So for that temporary period, they just didn't even sell that particular thing. So that was an output decision that they made. So that's one example. Um, another example is um, I recently bought a new car um, 
we needed something better for the snow. And the salesman was talking to us about how, oh, well, that company makes their truck out of aluminum. So that was an output decision. Um, aluminum might have been a, a lower cost material, for instance. And so the car company might have pivoted from steel to aluminum in some of its parts um, to save money and maybe to achieve some other things like uh, better fuel efficiency. So those are the ways that um, the cost, the variable and the fixed costs and how those are balanced can affect output decisions. So hopefully that addresses this element in general. Um, a lot of you, are, I focus mostly on variable costs in that one. A lot of you are gonna have companies that are heavier on the fixed cost side so I definitely want you and your instructor is going to be looking for you to think about when you have high fixed costs, what does that mean for, for your output? Um, how are you going to recoup those costs um, so that you can be sure to keep making a profit um, going forward? So then again, it, it, the, the decisions that they make are, are going to be a little bit different if it's a company that's mostly fixed costs, like a, like a software company. All right, so I'm going to keep moving. Um, thank you, Ellen, for addressing some of these questions so that we can get through all the elements here. The next section is overall market, and this has three elements. So the first element is asking you to discuss the market share for your company and its top competitors by providing details on current percentages for each company and describing the trend over time. <clears throat> so ideally, um, you can find, you definitely need to find the market share for your company. And when we say market share, we mean the kind of the piece of the pie that they have of the whole market. So if we go back to the example of Hershey's, um, if there's a market for candy bars, um, if 50% of it, of all candy bar sales are Hershey's, we would say that Hershey's has 50% market share. Um, and a lot of times you can find this just by, you know, a, a simple browser search um, because there are industry groups out there who have already done this research and you can sort of borrow that research and use it as a as a resource for your paper. But another way to do it is to find, um, you can find research on the total sales, like total candy bar sales in the country or total chocolate candy sales in the country for a given year. And then you can go to your company and find out how much they sold. And then you can get your ratio from that if you can't find the ratio already out there. And then you can do the same thing for the top competitors. So if it were Hershey, you would try to find the same thing for, for Mars and then any other competitors, maybe maybe Cadbury would, would be the next one or, or Dove Chocolate um, might be the next one. I'm not sure who after that. I'm not sure if Dove might be owned by Hershey, but um, you get the idea that you know at this point who your company's uh, main competitors are in the space. So you can either find those percentages already out there or you can figure them out yourselves using that method that I described. So Donna asks, how many companies you have to compare? Um, that's a great question, Donna. And the reason we don't have a number up here for that is because it really depends on the, on the market that you're in. Um, if I were to give a ballpark, um, I would say four because um, that's one of the, the later things that we learn about is the four firm concentration ratio. But you might be in a, in a business where maybe there aren't four main competitors. Maybe there's just two or three. Um, and when I say four, I, I include your firm in that as well. Uh, but, and you might be in a, in a space where there's a lot more competitors and you wanna look at more of them. Like the automobile industry, there's lots of research out there on the automobile industry in terms of market share. Um, it's, it's really easy to come by and you'll see it for all the top, you know, 10, 15 auto manufacturers. Um, so it would be fine to include more than four. Um, so really, it, it depends on your, so Southwest Airlines. Southwest, uh, the airline industry, I definitely usually see the, the top four, including Southwest. Um, so four would probably be a good number for that. Yeah, but that's a very well-researched um, industry, Donna, the, um, the airline industry. So you should be able to find percentages for that, um, either based on revenue. I've also seen it based on miles traveled, airline miles traveled. 
So you could you could slice it either way. I think it comes out a little bit different when they do it by revenue versus when they do it by miles traveled because Southwest is obviously a more low cost carrier. So it doesn't give them the advantage when you look at it uh, revenue versus miles, but that's a special nuance just for the airline industry. All right, so once you get the percentages for each one, you're also gonna want to see how those have changed over time. So the reason you wanna do that, and you might not be able to get specific numbers for every single firm, for every single year at many, for many other years, right? That, that might not be readily available to you, but you should be able to find some information about, especially for your firm, has that market share been going up or has it been going down? Because you know, if we say that Hershey's has 50% of the market, that might sound great. But if three years ago they were at 75% of the market, I'm sure that people at Hershey aren't feeling really good about 50% uh, if they had just lost 25% of the market. So it's really important that we uh, that we can understand the direction of where it's going because that's going to help inform some of your your later work here in this section and in the recommendation section. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. Um, and I see some people talking about um, read ahead for the other two market structures in future chapters. Um, it looks like you've got that one, Ellen. Um, but yeah, that does, that does align with this next element. So the next element in this section of overall market is asking you to describe the market structure for your firm and analyze how this affects their ability to influence the overall market. So in this instance, you definitely need to state what you think the market structure is. Now, one, one thing that, that we do realize that's um, a bit of a drawback with the timing of this is that there are two kinds of market structures that we haven't covered yet. Um, in week six, we're gonna cover oligopolies and monopolies. This week, we covered perfect competition and monopolistic competition. So the, the reading for next week will give you some insight, but also um, we have, let me make sure I see if it's shared here. Um, it gives a table here and it's in, the, it's in the guide right here if you see on this line, use the criteria listed in table 12.1 on page 392 of the textbook. Um, so, you know, I don't expect you to read everything there is to know um, about an oligopoly at this point in a monopoly. Keep in mind, this is the milestone. The bar is not set quite as high as for the final. So this is not gonna make or break your ability to do this section. But if you go to that, if you go to that section, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that table on page 392, it gives you um, just a quick breakdown of the different characteristics of each type. And that should, that should really help you make the decision and then start talking about it in this section of your paper. And then if you determine that your company is an oligopoly or a monopoly based on that table, then you can go read a little bit more about it in the chapter, um, you know, so that you can fill out what you need to do for this section um, if, if you feel that, that you need that. But otherwise, you know, if you think that your company is in monopolistic competition, then, then you're gonna be all set. All right, so, um, so once you decide what the market structure is for the firm, you're gonna analyze how this affects their ability to influence the overall market. So you've picked the market structure, you've described why it's that market structure, and now you're gonna talk about their ability to influence the overall market. So again, knowing the differences between each of the market structure types will, will help you talk about their ability to influence the market. Um, the more, concentrated and industry gets, you know, the fewer firms that there are, the more that one company can make an impact. So that will be a major thing that you're gonna look at. And also, if even within a very concentrated market where there's maybe only a few firms, the leader in that, in that group is oftentimes um, setting the pace in terms of pricing or product offerings. But it's also true that a new, a new up and comer might break into the market and that might shake things up and 
um, and influence the, the bigger companies in the industry. So you want to see what that looks like for your company and put it in terms of the market structure that you've determined that it is. Yeah, Ellen, so that table is referenced here. It's not, it's not linked, although that would be a good idea for us to link to, but um, the page number is given for that, that table. Um, and then there's just some more notes here about ways that you can further, um, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped. I skipped barriers to entry, guys. I'm, I'm really sorry, it's not bolded here. So that was, um, describing your market structure was the last element. Um, before that one, my apologies, is the barriers to entry, which is the second paragraph here on this page of the template, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of the guide. Um, and this is asking you to analyze the barriers to entry for your firm. Now, again, this concept is explored in chapter 14, and we've got the link here to review the video that goes over all that. So that's something you can skip ahead to as well. Um, but for the most part, you're going to be looking at anything that keeps other firms out of this industry. So not barriers to entry for your firm, not things that they had to do to overcome competition or, or regulation to get into this business, but threats that they could get from out from newcomers or from maybe competitors in other regions. So again, with the Hershey Kiss example, what keeps some group of people or for some random person from deciding they're going to start a nationwide chocolate bar company? <laughs> to compete with Hershey. Um, and you can go through the reasons, the ways that a company might be able to break in and give Hershey some decent competition, or the reasons, the barriers to entry that would keep them from giving Hershey some real competition. So that's what you're going to analyze here. So again, a lot of students make the, make the mistake that it's the barriers to entry for your firm, but it's the barriers to entry for new competitors. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. So those are the three that, again, these are the three for the overall market. We did market share, barriers to entry, and then market structure. And most of the time students do really well on these um, as long as they don't forget to include them. <laughs> so my advice to you is make sure that you've got three separate, at least three separate paragraphs, but three separate topics that you're covering in this section on overall market and you'll be all set. Okay, we do just have a couple minutes left, so I want to quickly talk about the recommendation section. Um, the recommendation section has three elements, and you'll notice that each of these three elements is asking you to incorporate information that you've already used in the paper. So this is where you're going to start synthesizing things to make some conclusions and some suggestions for your firm. So the first one is asking you to develop a recommendation for how the firm can manage its future production by synthesizing the data presented. So here you're going to be taking information from the supply and demand section, where we talked about the supply side of things, and then also from the costs of production section, because that gets into a little bit more detail on the supply side. So some things that you explored there in terms of how they're managing their costs or um, how, they're, how they're managing their supply overall, um, you're going to look at here. The second element is, as, is um, looking for you to suggest how the firm's position within the market and among its competitors will allow it to take the recommended action. So you recommended something in the element above, and now you're going to explain, well, how are they going to, how are they actually going to execute on this? What about their position within the market will allow them to do this? Um, so do make sure that whatever you recommend, it's something that, that they could do. So a lot of students I've seen recommend things that you might only be able to do if you had, you know, if you already had a, a good profit margin and you had the money to do those sorts of things. So make sure that your company has that if that's the kind of suggestion you're making. Or if it's about um, offering new products, um, make sure that they're able to do that based on um, their ability perhaps to, to advertise and have the technology to create those new products. And then lastly, describe how the firm can sus sustain its success going forward by evaluating trends in demand and price elasticity. 
So this one wants you to look at both things that you did in the demand section for milestone two and the price elasticity section for milestone two. So both of those should be referenced here. So you analyzed some of the trends in demand in that section. So how is the firm going to continue to respond to those trends in demand going forward? Um, you'll want to talk about that. And then also on the price elasticity side, you made a determination on whether demand was inelastic or elastic. So you're going to want to use that knowledge um, in the determinants of demand that, of price elasticity of demand that support that determination to explain their strategy going forward in terms of pricing. So again, this doesn't have to be a hugely long explanation, but we do want to make sure that you touch on those points when you describe um, your suggestions for the firm moving forward. So really, it's this is your chance to bring in all the things that you've done from each of the sections and use it to, to kind of give some specific advice for the company. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, my throat is getting to me a little bit. I just am getting over strep throat, so <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm coughing on you guys. So that's it. Um, of course, there's always uh, your citations. This is just a little note about citations in our, in our guide, but um, in-text citations are in APA format, and your reference uh, list is in APA format as well. And there's some links here if you need some help with that. But since it's 9 o'clock, um, and I see lots of thank yous and no more questions, I'm going to assume that 201 students are doing well. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, it was recorded. We'll get that out as soon as we can tomorrow. Um, and welcome ECO 202 students. I will switch over to your stuff. Um, Jimmy, are you sticking around for 202 or are you 201? If you need help, uh, your, your best bet is uh, your instructor. They are they are going to help you with, with the content piece of it. And you, if you need help with the writing, the writing center can help with that part of it. Um, Melora asks us if we'll have comments back on Milestone 2 prior to Milestone 3. Um, you should have feedback by Sunday, but I understand that this milestone is also due on Sunday, so they could come right around the same time. These are very independent of each other, so the feedback that you get on the milestone two shouldn't have a major impact on what you write for milestone three. Um, but I do understand wanting to just know if you're on the right track. Um, but I, I, my point is that you, you shouldn't really worry because the topics are, are broken down to be pretty distinct. Um, and then with the, with the exception of the recommendation section, but since it's a milestone, you'll have a chance to revise all that. All right. Thank you all so much. And for 202 students, thank you for being patient while we wrap up 201. They have quite a long milestone. So I appreciate your letting us finish that. And now I will pull up the guide for ECO 202 and we can get into your milestone three. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the, the full guide. So I'm gonna scroll down to where milestone three begins. So milestone three begins right here at monetary policy. So this is the only um, this is the only topic discussed in this milestone. It's just three slides. It's very similar to last week's milestone on fiscal policy. Um, basically, when the federal government is looking to have an impact on the economy, they've got two toolboxes. One is the fiscal policy toolbox where they can impact the economy mainly through taxation and spending, government spending. Um, and the other toolbox is monetary policy. That's governed by the Federal Reserve, which is our independent central bank. Um, and they mainly impact the economy through targeting interest rates. Um, so they work independently of one another, usually in conjunction for one goal, but they're operated independently. Like, like I mentioned, the Federal Reserve is our um, central bank, but it's independent of our elected officials. And the fiscal policy is governed by Congress and the president. So while they have the same, a lot of the same goals, they do operate separate from one another. So when you talk about the Federal Reserve and actions they take, you're always talking about monetary policy. 
So that should definitely be the focus of your um, of everything you write here is on their actions. Yes, Ellen, that's true. Um, and that's something we can actually talk about, especially at the end here. Um, when we look at the, the monetary policy actions, that sometimes their policies contradict. Um, ideally, they would be going together. I mean, there's there's one common problem. Let's say it's um, high unemployment. You know, you don't want unemployment to be high. Uh, they would be putting in policies in place to bring unemployment down. But, you know, because the world isn't perfect, it doesn't always work out that way. But the, the key thing I want you to know, because I have seen this happen to a lot of students, is that they end up talking about things that are really fiscal policy in the monetary policy section and vice versa. They talk about Federal Reserve stuff in the fiscal policy section. So everything you talk about here should be stuff that the Federal Reserve or the Fed, as you might often hear it called, um, the stuff that the Fed does. So just as a quick overview, the Fed has four main goals. Um, the two are their top priority. That's price stability. Um, so we think of that as inflation and high employment or low unemployment. And then, of course, they want to contribute to economic growth um, and overall financial market stability. So those are their four main goals. I um, mean, usually we see them reacting to um, employment and inflation, <coughs> those first two on the list. So um, the main tools that the Fed uses are decreasing or increasing the money supply through open market operations, changing the required reserve ratio, and changing the discount rate, and changes to interest rates. So you can read up on the Fed policy tools here on this link and check out this, this video for a bit of further understanding. This is just so you can understand what they do. At the end of the day, they, they do all of this to influence the interest rate. Um, so you're gonna want to, in this first element, just like in the last one, you're going to want to look at the pol monetary policies in place at the start of your chosen decade. So if you picked, for some reason I like to pick on the 1980s, I guess because I was born in the 1980s. Um, if you chose the 1980s when it was 1980, there was, there was an interest rate target set by the Fed at that time. So that's a very clear way to start off this, uh, this element here. You can say this was what the Fed had set it at, and this is why it was set there. Had it been brought down to that number? Had it been brought up to that number from some lower number? And why? So that's going to set the stage. So you use this first element, this first slide, to set the stage. This is how things were. This is what the, the Fed was doing in terms of interest rate targeting, and this is, this is why they were doing it. And as always, you're going to have the basics, your bullet points, <coughs> excuse me, in any, um, in any data or graphs on the slide, and then the deeper explanation in the notes section. Now the second slide is where you're going to get a little bit more involved into the, oh, and there, this is a double slide, my goodness, um, into the macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomic models. And we talked about this in the last, um, the last webinar, but for anyone who wasn't able to catch that one or, or just to, to make sure that everyone feels comfortable with it. Um, the main one that students tend to use because it's pretty versatile and it's easy to work with um, in sort of theoretical terms is the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. So you're gonna look at policy changes throughout the decade. So as things happen in the economy and the Fed is always looking at minor changes in the economy, they're gonna decide how they are, will react to that. So they meet on a very regular basis and they put out um, minutes about you know, the decisions that they've come to and, and the reasons for them. So all that stuff is out there for you to read. Um, so you can, you can find all of that you know, for the years that you wanna look at um, and see were they changing their target interest rate? Were they changing it up? Were they changing it down? And what was the reason for that? And then to further show your understanding of the models, um, you can use those. So we've got the ADAS model, like I mentioned, and also the supply and demand of money model. That's another one that you can use to explain, okay, well, if the Fed raised interest rates um, because of 
high inflation, why is that going to help? How is that going to help the price level? How is that going to help price stability? Uh, and those models will help explain that and we'll show your instructor that, that you understand these models and um, why the actions make sense. And again, main points on the slide, notes, um, notes will be where you have your, your detailed explanations. And we've got links. Um, these are hyperlinks. If anyone was having trouble getting the hyperlinks to work, remember to put the, um, the PowerPoint when you open it up in, in slideshow view, and then the links will be clickable. And the last one, just like, just like with the fiscal policy, it's kind of like the exact same format, um, is to look at the impact of the monetary policies. So you've already outlined what the policies were. There might have been a, a couple of things that you wanted to talk about depending on the decade and how active the Fed was during your decade. Um, and you want to see, did it achieve their goals? If their goal was to bring inflation down, did it achieve that goal? Um, if the goal was to increase employment um, or increase GDP growth, um, did it achieve that goal? So just like before with the fiscal policy impact, you do have the data already. You have the data for milestone one, so you can look at that as, as your baseline level. Um, and if for some reason um, it didn't meet, meet its goals, you can try to give some explanation as to why it didn't reach its goals. And if it did reach its goals, you can just you know reiterate um, the models that you presented earlier that explain why that policy was able to reach its goal. And Ellen gave a great example that sometimes um, the policies of the, the fiscal policies can contradict the monetary policies and that makes them both sort of ineffective. So that might be one thing to talk about. Um, or even if it did reach its goal, did it, you know, sometimes it can sort of get you closer to the goal, but not, it's not as great a success as everybody was hoping for, um, even though it kind of worked. So you can maybe talk about, you know, why it wasn't as great as it could have been or, or how it could have been a stronger response um, in terms of timing or in terms of other things that were going on. Um, so those are all the ways that you can look at the success of, of the given policies and maybe some of the policies, the actions were successful and others weren't. So you might need to look at them separately too if that's the case in your decade. <clears throat> All right, and that is actually all we have to do for this one. <coughs> Again, it's, it's just like the fiscal policy one that you just did, except you're looking at the tools of the Federal Reserve instead of the tools of um, Congress and the President. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good note, Ellen, <laughs> um, the cooperation of the financial sector. And yeah, and some decades do have some interesting stories um, in terms of the financial sector. So that's that's always something to consider. And, and, and something we saw in um, this more recently is that there are limitations to monetary policy um, and to fiscal policy. So sometimes you, know, you put a policy in place, but it's just not enough to get the job done all on its own. You also need um, help from other areas of the economy to, to make it fully work. Um, and sometimes, one toolbox, like the monetary policy toolbox, might not be as well suited to a problem as the fiscal policy toolbox. So that's sometimes a reason um, that we don't see things work as well um, as we hope that they would. Looks like Courtney might have a question. Yeah. Ellen on fiscal policy. Yep, we've definitely seen a lot of that too. <laughs> <coughs> if I had, so Courtney asks, if I had two recessions in my time period, do I address both or just one? Definitely both, Courtney, because um, recessions are, so the, the Federal Reserve, like I said, they're always meeting and making small adjustments as the economy goes through its regular business cycle. But with a recession, you know, it usually becomes sort of like all hands on deck. <laughs> Um, and there's a much stronger reaction from um, the Federal Reserve and generally from, um, from Congress in terms of fiscal policy. So you definitely want to look at both. 
Yeah. And if, and if for any reason you didn't look at both for your fiscal policy one, you can always go back and add the one that you didn't investigate um, for the final. Yep, and it might have been that um, that the response to one of the recessions, um, in terms of when I say the response, uh, I should have said rather the impact of the policies during one recession were maybe more successful than the impact of policies in another recession. So that gives you a nice talking point. You can sort of compare and contrast. Um, you know, well, why why was the policy actions here so much more successful than the policy actions for this recession? So that gives you something interesting to talk about too. And there are gonna be some of you, depending on the time period that you picked, where the Federal Reserve was not as active as it has been in other times. Um, and that's okay. Like I said, the Federal Reserve has always been meeting. <laughs> um, they always make these, even these small adjustments. Um, so just focus on what they did do and why they did it and what the impact of it was, even if it was small stuff compared to, you know, what we hear about more recently. Yes, for sure. You know, Ellen, I saw something funny <laughs> and I don't know if anyone um, on the line watches Jeopardy. Um, I don't get to watch it a lot because it's when I'm putting my kids to bed, but I used to watch it all the time when I was younger. And um, it was the, la the last column left that everybody was avoiding and, and the second round of Jeopardy was economics. <laughs> I was completely full. No one wanted to touch it. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> so, <clears throat> yes, dismal science. Nobody wants to go near it except for us. <laughs> The crazy people who decided to study it. <laughs> Me too. I like that aspect of it, the the balance of it, you know. It's um you know, and this isn't pertinent to your papers, guys, people who are um to your project rather, people who are on the on the line, students. But um uh, you hear a lot of times people say, um, well, you know, running an economy is like running a business. And it's actually not at all <laughs> um, because the economy, you really have to get more of a balance. Um, you're not just aiming for profit. You're aiming for, for that stability. So usually when you do one thing, it has a, a counter effect on the other side. I'm um, like when we study exchange rates, which we'll get to uh, next week. But, you know, like when we have a, a strong currency, you know, that's good for some things. Well, you know, your strong dollar can buy you lots of, foreign trips and foreign goods, but it makes it hard to sell your stuff to other people because now it's so expensive. So you see a lot of that in economics where you have this sort of balancing act between two things. We see that with you know inflation and unemployment. It's not a perfect relationship, but in general, um, we do have that relationship where when you know the economy is overheating, it's going well, inflation becomes a concern, prices rise too much. Uh, but then on the other side, if we worry too much about that, employment can get too low and then not enough people have jobs. So again, it seems to be a constant tightrope walk when it comes to um, getting the policy right. Or that's not the case in business. In, in business, you kind of are always sort of forward looking, bro, bro, bro. And, um, you know, they're just, they're very, very different approaches. So I like my students to, to kind of come away understanding that a whole economy is very different than a business, just a, a business that's trying to maximize its profits. So um, Melissa is asking, is the first slide primarily what was happening at the beginning of the time period? Um, <coughs> yeah, so that just like um, Ellen said, it's, it's sort of the, the starting off point where monetary policy was right at the beginning. So at any point in time, the Federal Reserve has a, a target interest rate, which kind of speaks to their monetary policy. And that was adjusted at some point, um, either up or down from where it had been before in response to the economic conditions of that time. So you'll want to understand why it was set at that rate, when it was set at that rate, and explain that in that first slide.
and then of course, like I said, they're constantly adjusting that as the as the decade or as as time goes on. They're they're always making you know small adjustments. So that's what you're going to be looking at. You're going to be looking at the major adjustments um, throughout the rest of the ten year time period in your second slide. Oh, thank you. Yes, Ellen. We have it. Um, I definitely have to get that added to. So the the website that Ellen has shared, um, one of our colleagues recently found, um, and, and this is stuff that's always been out there, but we didn't have. I don't think we had one centralized place to find it all. So he shared it with us that he found for one of his other courses here at SMU. Um, that makes it super easy to find all of um, the information you need. So. We shared it with the instructors in um, in Eco 202, but yeah, we should definitely get it added to um, to this guide now that we have it. Yeah, so once you go to um, like Ellen said, once you go to this link, it this one happens to default to 1986, but you'll notice that there's a little drop down and and you can change it to um, any of the years that you need. So yeah, this just makes it much, much easier for you to find what you need. Again, this is already out there, but now we've got one website that can sort of finish it off for everybody. Oh, good. <laughs> I don't know if it's new, Michelle. I don't know if it's new or not because students have been searching this for a while, and I definitely remember hearing students having trouble finding what they needed. So when our, um, when our colleague came across the site, I was like, wow, this is a godsend, but uh, maybe it's just new not something we just randomly uncovered. Maybe they've reorganized things in terms of um, their website over at the Fed. Overall, I mean, I think that they have fantastic resources. I mean, obviously Fred, which we use a lot, especially in Milestone One, um, is, is phenomenal. Um, and they've got lots of educational materials to help you understand how to use Fred. Uh, and their materials are great. And uh, yeah, so this just adds to that. They really do a great job making sure that all their stuff can be used, you know, in for education. Anna, I'm not I'm not sure I would say you need to review all of them. <laughs> um, if if you have from milestone one the federal funds rate over you know for each year, you'll see the parts where um, where it moved the most. There's going to be times where they don't change it, you know, especially this these last when how long has it been? Almost ten years. It hasn't moved much. Um, so depending on your time period, there might only be a few major shifts in their target rate. So you would you would see where those shifts are on your graph, and then you could go and just get the minutes there, at least as a jumping off point. I mean, we don't want to bury you in reading, um, so that's a way to narrow it down. That's how I would start. Yeah, Michelle, that's a great point. And so, and if that's another way to look at it, if you have, um, um, you know, a couple of recessions, like someone had mentioned, um, in your in your time period, those are the those are the statements from the Fed that you're definitely going to want to read because, again, during a recession is when we usually see the biggest policy response um, from the federal government and from the Federal Reserve. Ha, Ellen, for what they don't say, that's very interesting. <laughs> it's like reading tea leaves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You'll you'll notice now that after you take this course and you guys now know all the lingo and um, you're very familiar with what all this stuff means. Um, after having taken this course, that there are people who wait with bated breath for the Fed. The Fed's going to announce today what they talked about at their meeting, and it's it's big news in the um 
in the business and economics world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, and that's um, you know something we want want you guys to take away too from this, um, especially as a lot of you, maybe all of you, are, are business majors. Is that um, these policy decisions that are made at the macro level do have micro impacts? So they have impacts to to households, of course, um, and to businesses. So it's important that we sort of recognize that connection, um, especially for for your goals, you know, I know a lot of my students are hoping to own their own business one day or just grow the ranks at their um, at the business that they're currently in. So every business needs to know how these policies are going to impact them. Um, so we really want you to be able to come away with um, with that kind of knowledge too, which we did cover a bit in milestone one in terms of um, you know how how all that stuff fit together, but you know, something to always keep in the back of your mind so you don't think you're just an economist in training, but you're also a business person in training too. Yeah, those are those are great resources. So, you know, The Economist and The Financial Times that, that Kate and Ellen and other instructors um, are recommending you guys. And one other, um, PBS has some really great, if you like watching news and you want to kind of get some more financial news, um, I find PBS News Hour doesn't just cover financial stuff, but um, they they do cover some financial things. And then they have the um, oh gosh, now I'm going to forget what it is. The I think the Business Hour comes right on after PBS News Hour. They have um, the business program that comes on right after that. That one is is really great. I mean, it's I think it's uh, a quick one. It's I think it might just be half an hour, but they go through all the stuff and if. If you're really a, a business nut and you want to learn more about industry and, and business in general and all the goings on, that's a great program to watch on PBS. Um, highly recommended if you want to nerd out. The Nightly Business Report. Is that the right one? No, that's, that's CNBC. That's not the one I want. Well, I'll have to, nightly business, is that, okay, it is the nightly business report, okay. Um, yeah, I, I really like that one. It's, it's on late for me, but if you're, um, if you have a DVR or if you're a night owl, it's, um, it's worth catching. And that, and I, the reason I really like it, and I thought of our students because of it, is because they, they really make those connections between the macro and the micro side of things, you know. They talk about a lot of the macro stuff, but they can bring it into how that's affecting actual businesses and actual households. So it's super relevant for us. Oh, you can find them on YouTube. That's good to know. Yeah, I can't I can't usually stay up late enough to watch it regularly, but every once in a while I catch it and I always enjoy it. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I will give you all back these three minutes. <laughs> but um, just some quick things to remember. Make sure that all of your slides have um, the notes section filled in with uh, the sort of explanatory detail that goes along with the the bullet points and any data that you share on the slide and make sure that you do include a slide with your reference list and do use in-text citations for anything that deserves it um, on the slide and in the notes section. All right, just going to scroll down to the reference page if anybody needs a refresher of what that looks like. But um, overall, students do very well in this section, especially after getting their feet wet with fiscal policy. As long as you focus on Federal Reserve actions, you will be A-OK -okay and I'm sure do very well in this section. And if you have any concerns, um, reach out to your instructor as soon as you can so you've got plenty of time to get an answer from them and incorporate it into your work.
Yes, Kate and Ellen are very right about the bias in economics, especially macroeconomics. So um, super important to try and make sure you get both sides of it so you're not just skewing to, to one partisan side because it, it does get, get very political at times. That's why we really want to encourage you to, to incorporate some of those macroeconomic models so we can take out a lot of the, that political side of things and keep it on the theory, at least for intro. And of course, the empirical data, which we covered really well in the first milestone. All right, well, thank you all so much. Um, we will get the recording. I'll get the recording up um, on my YouTube channel um, as soon as I can um, in the morning. And then we send that out to all the students, um, to all the instructors, the rather. This is the webinar? To all the instructors, um, as as, again, as soon as I can tomorrow morning so that they can post it in your class. So hopefully you'll get it um, sometime midday uh, in your course tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Oh, I'm already feeling much better. Antibiotics are like a miracle. I was, I had to go to jury duty on Monday with, um,